Well, as I prepared this week, the words of an old gospel song went through my mind. That happens to me often. But this one says, you may ask me where I'm headed. You may ask me where I'm bound. I'm going to a country across the sea, and I know I'll have a mansion, and I know I'll have a crown, for I'm bound for the kingdom of the free. Yes, I'm bound for the kingdom of the blessed and the free, and my Jesus soon is coming after me. There's nothing to compare with the glory over there. I'm bound for the kingdom of the free. And you are bound for that kingdom if you have accepted Christ. But along the road of life, we get a few bumps. And those bumps are caused by sin. And sometimes we find ourselves wondering about that. We still have our human nature, our sinful nature. And so we're getting into a story in Joshua this morning about a guy that committed a sin and it affected the whole nation. And I've entitled this, How Can Just One Sin Be So Serious? I guess I should have called it What a Single Sin Can Do, but I've seen that in so many advertisements I couldn't use it. So why can just, how can just one sin be so serious? Turn with me if you have a Bible or really just sit there and let this soak in. This is a story of something that happened right after they conquered the city of uh, Jericho. This is from Joshua chapter 7, starting with verse 19. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give him the praise. Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was, hidden in the tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all of the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Allow me to lead you in a brief prayer. Father, uh, we're just going into a simple story from the Bible. May we from the book have a conviction of sin and what it can accomplish. And I pray again that everyone here will receive something that will be of help to them. In Jesus' name, amen. The Israelites crossed the Jordan River in a miraculous way. They conquered the city of Jericho in a miraculous way. But Jericho was at one end of a valley that started at the Jordan River and ran up into the hill country of central Israel and at the other end of that valley was a little city called Ai. It too was a fortress city, but not very large. So Joshua did as he usually did. He sent some spies to spy out the city. They came back with a report something like this. It's not a very big city. Don't wear the people out by sending the whole army up there. Two or 3,000 men will take it easily. Just send that many, we'll be all right. Now, when I read that, I find myself wondering, was that report motivated by faith in God or was that report motivated by pride? I think it was motivated by pride. I don't think they were saying that God is with us and uh, we only need a few men. I think they were saying, hey, we took Jericho easily. We can handle this even easier. And you know, with pride always comes the danger of self-confidence. Many times we have a saying among preachers, uh, be careful when you go through anything major like a huge building program. There's always a letdown afterwards. 
And any time we have a victory in our life, we may have a letdown afterward. So be careful. Well, they went up to battle against Ai, two or 3,000 men. The men of Ai came out. There weren't that many of them. But they beat the stuffings out of the Israeli army and sent them back in disorder. And Israel had 36 casualties. Now, that may not seem like a long casualty list, and it isn't. Not compared to usual list in war. But they had never lost a man in battle in that generation. They had, on the other side of Georgia, of Jordan, whipped the uh, army of King Sion. They had whipped the army of King Og. They had won out against Moab. They had conquered Jericho. They had not had a casualty in battle. And here they are facing this little city, and they have had to retreat. And that was an upheaval in their minds. You know, God had led them all through this. They had a supernatural book. They had a supernatural leader. The supernatural had been a part of it. God had put a fear of them supernaturally into the minds of the people. And then they lost this battle. What had happened? Well, you read about Joshua and the elders falling before God and praying. In the seventh chapter and verses six through nine, I'll not read that, you're capable of reading, but uh, Joshua is praying and the elders have put dust on their hair, a head a sign of humility, and uh, they are in misery. And Joshua prays, listen, God, why didn't you leave us on the other side of Jordan? We're sorry we even crossed over. We didn't want to be defeated in battle. Why did we even come across the Jordan River? We were all right over there. And you read that prayer, and it seems like a prayer of humility, and that's what it seems like. But you go ahead and read it, and it's a very negative prayer. And everything about that prayer is blaming God. That's about part of it. And so then you come to Joshua 7, verses 10 and 11, when God answers a prayer. And I'll not read this either, but God says, hey, you don't need to, you stand up. It's time to quit praying and start taking action. And I would never, ever in my life put a downer on prayer. I really believe in it. And I believe God answers prayer. But I know that prayer must never become a substitute for action any more than action should ever be a substitute for prayer. The two must be kept in balance. And God said, stand up. The trouble is sin. Take action. Find out about it. And God said, here's the plan. Tomorrow morning you have all of the people purify themselves and we will have everyone march in front of you in tribes and I'll pick a tribe and then you have that tribe mark in, in front of you and I'll pick a clan and you have that clan march in front of me and I'll pick a family and God said you have that family march in front of me and I'll pick out the one that's guilty and they did that and it ended up with a man named Achan being picked by God as the one guilty of sin and Joshua said, what's the trouble? And Achan said, well, I have to admit I sinned. We were commanded not to take any of the plunder from Babel, from Jericho. It was to go into God's treasury. And he said, I found a Babylonian robe. I found 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels. And he said, I hid them in my tent. They are there. Joshua sent messengers. They found the stuff buried in the tent of Achan. They brought it back and get God's command. Achan was to be stoned to death. Not only he, but his entire family. Not only that, all of their livestock. 
and they left them in a valley and piled stones over them. <clears throat> and that pile of stones became a memorial to the seriousness of sin. And we learned three lessons from it. Number one, how sin starts and grows. Francis Schaeffer, the author, said it is significant that Achan said, I saw a Babylonian robe. He said that tells us something about Achan. A robe in Babylon was a robe that was very expensive. If you had a Babylonian robe, it meant that you were really in style, that you were somebody to look, be looked up to. You were somebody important. And the fact that he stole that, Francis Schaeffer said, probably means that this guy was materialistic. He wanted to be noticed. He had pride. He wanted to be looked upon as being somebody. Now, we know why he took the silver and the gold. You can buy things with that. But Achan said, I saw it. I coveted it. I took it. I hid it. And he might as well have added, I suffered for it. In that seventh chapter of Joshua, all the 21st verse, we find that he says exactly that. I coveted them. I took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. And so here's Achan. He's guilty, and he has to pay the price. We have other illustrations of this in the Bible. Uh, for instance, I find myself thinking about this man called Naaman in the book of uh, 2 Kings, I think it is, chapter 5. But Naaman was a man that was a leader of the Assyrian army, but he had leprosy. And he'd been told that there was a prophet in Israel that could cure the leprosy. And so he went down to visit the king of Israel. Well, the king couldn't do it. The king said, what are you doing, trying to find a reason to start a war? But the old prophet Elisha sent a message and sent him here. Send him here. I'll show him there's a prophet in Israel. By the way, there's a little lesson there. I want to get this in. It's a little dig. We still make the mistake of going to the politicians before we listen to the prophets, you know it? <laughs> Naaman made that mistake, and it's been going on ever since. But when he visited Elisha, Elisha didn't even come out of his house. He sent his servant out, and he said to Naaman, my master says, go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River, and you'll be healed of your leprosy. And Naaman hit the ceiling. He had his own ideas about how he should be healed. He said, I thought the prophet would come out and wave his hand over the leprous spot. He'd been watching too many faith healers on TV, you know, but he said, I thought he would wave his hand over the leprous spot and I'd be healed. He said, we have better rivers in Damascus than the River Jordan. And he walked away, but some of the leaders in his army said, listen, master, if the prophet would have asked something difficult and something expensive, you would have tried it. Why not try this? And so Naaman humbled himself, stripped off his royal garments, went down into the River Jordan, immersed himself six times and came up a leper six times. And on the seventh time when he completed his obedience, he came up completely healed. And he went back to the prophet and offered him changes of garments and silver and gold. And the old prophet turned him down and sent him on his way home. But Gehazi was a servant of the prophet. He thought, we're missing a great opportunity. He ran on after Naaman, and he lied. He stopped Naaman, and he said, right after you left, two young men came in from the school of the prophet. Uh, they're poor. They could use some garments and they could use some money. And Naaman gave him even more than he asked for. And Gehazi left thinking, boy, I've made it. 
I am set for life until he met the prophet Elijah. Elijah. And the old prophet looked at him and he said, I know what you did. And the leprosy of Naaman will cling to you. And it did. And Gehazi lived his life as a leper and died as a leper. I imagine that Achan was thinking, I wish I would have dug that hole deeper. But you can't dig a hole deep enough to get rid of your sins. And Gehazi couldn't get rid of his. In James, I believe it's chapter 1, yes, verses 14 and 15. But each one, now that includes you and that includes me. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire, he's dragged away and enticed. And after that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. That is a warning from, for Christians. We are not capable of getting rid of our sins. We need redemption. So Achan confessed, he confessed to Joshua about his sin, but it was too late. So that's how sin starts and grows. Now second, let's see how sin finds us out. Achan probably thought, I have committed a perfect crime. Uh, the owners of what I took are dead. Nobody saw me do this. It's a perfect crime. But it wasn't a perfect crime. God knew all about it. And to find an Achan among Israel at that time was like finding Judas among the disciples or like finding the serpent in the Garden of Eden. But we remember that in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, the scripture reads, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. If you sow to righteousness, you are going to reap the benefits of righteousness. But if you sow to sin, you are going to reap what sin offers, and that, of course, is bad. So sin finds you out. There's a passage of Scripture in the book of Hebrews, the fourth chapter, 13th verse. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Did you get that? Nothing is hidden from God. What makes us think we can get by with something? It is satanic. When we think we can sin and get by with it. That is Satan's work in our mind. So nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And we will have to give an account. Listen, sin finds you out in three areas. It's going to find you out in time. It's going to find you out in your conscience. It's going to find you out in eternity. Look at how sin finds you out in time. Moses, before he led Israel out of Egypt, was in the royal court as a young man. He was an Israelite himself, and he found a Hebrew Israelite uh, who was being really threatened by an Egyptian. Moses killed the Egyptian and thought no one would ever know about it. But a few days later, when he was involved in sort of a serious situation, the person he was involved with said, you're going to kill me like you killed that Egyptian? And Moses had to leave Egypt, and he spent 40 years in the back pastures of Sinai before God brought him back to lead Israel out of Egypt. He knew the wages of sin. I uh, remember reading a story about a man named John Doan, D-O-N-N-E, but they pronounced it Doan. He was the dean of St. Paul's Cathedral in London two centuries ago. John Doan, before his conversion, was known as a poet and an author and an economist. 
But after he became the dean and preached at St. Paul's Cathedral, he was out in the cemetery behind the cathedral one day watching the grave diggers dig the grave for a funeral that was to be held that afternoon. And suddenly as they dug, they came up with a human skull. And the grave diggers said, That's, that grave is too close to this one. They should not have been that close together. But as he held up the skull, there was a headless nail driven into the skull, sticking out of it. John Doan said, uh, do you know who was buried in that grave? And uh, one of the grave diggers said, yeah, I know. He was a drunkard. He was a man that was drunk every night. Well, he died, we were told, because he drank over two quarts of liquor and came home in a stupor and just died. We all expected something like that. John Doan stood there looking at the skull with the nail in it, and he said, may I have the nail? And they handed it to him. And John Doan said, do you know anything about the man's wife? And one of them said, yes, she was a very fine lady. But we always wonder why she remarried within a month after her husband died. John Doan took the nail with him and called on that lady. He laid it in front of her and she broke down. She said, yes, I put up with that man's drunkenness year after year. And when he fell into a drunken stupor, I just took a hammer and I drove this nail into his skull. She said, I'm guilty. Sin found her out in time. Sin finds you out in conscience, sometimes very quickly. For Judas, after betraying Jesus, within a day or so, he threw the coins of the betrayal into the temple and said, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. Peter cussed and denied Jesus. What happened there? He broke down shortly after in tears and repented. But it was a little different with the brothers of Joseph. They sold him into slavery and they, they convinced their father that he'd been killed of a wild animal in the field. But it was years later, probably over 20 years later, that they went down to Egypt to buy grain because they were suffering from a famine they didn't know their brother Joseph was now the prime minister of Egypt. They didn't recognize him. And they were in trouble in Egypt and Joseph could hear them talk. And they said, this has come upon us because of the treatment of our brother Joseph. Yeah, found them out in their conscience. Finally, it always does. But sin will find you out in eternity. We will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the deeds done in the flesh. I am convinced as I read the Bible that we will be judged on at least three aspects. We'll be judged by what we say. We will be. And I'd like to remind you that profanity is still profanity. It's taking God's name in vain, and you be careful of it. And it is so prominent today to even text OMG or say, oh, my God. We hear it in TV shows, and that is in vain, and you better quit it because you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be judged also not only by what we say, we're going to be judged by what we think. And if you are the kind of person that keeps putting wrong stuff into your mind by what you read or by what you watch or by what you talk about, this is going to go hard. And of course, we're going to be judged by our actions. We have to get that straight. Sin is going to find us out. Even when you become a Christian and you come to Christ and you are redeemed from your sins, it does not keep you from paying the price. And that brings me to my third point, how sin hinders and hurts. 
One psychologist wrote this, and I wrote it down. I want to read it to you. Sin is individual in its origin, but it is social in its results. Individual in origin, social in results. What's he saying? You sin as an individual, you're just one person. But when you sin, it's going to affect more than you. It's going to affect a lot of people. We know that. You use profanity and other people to pick it up. You get involved in adultery, it's going to affect more than you. It's going to break up families. You just think about sin in every way. It is social in its results. Apply this to Achan. Achan was just one guy. He had robbed God. He sinned. But what happened? 36 casualties. His own family completely wiped out. But 36 other families that were in sorrow because of his sin. Folks, we got to see it. These things are in the Bible to convict us of the fact we never sin and get by and we're going to pay the price. Even David, King David, a man after God's own heart, David was forgiven, but in his lifetime, he still had to pay the price. Tragedy after tragedy in his life. I think of Samson, Superman, you know, supernaturally strong. God raised up Samson to be a judge in Israel and to help Israel. But Samuel would get in, Samson would get involved in sin. And finally one day, he was in adultery with this gal and the Philistines were after him and somebody cried out, Samson, the Philistines are waiting on you. And he got up and said, hey, I'll shake myself and then I'll go out and shake them like I always did. But God had drawn a line. The Bible said he didn't know that God was no longer with him. And he was taken prisoner and his eyes were put out and it ended up in his death. Yeah, it always hinders and hurts. I uh, had a guy point out something to me. I don't know why I failed to see this. I thought I knew quite a bit about the Bible, but you always keep learning, you know. But he pointed this out in Acts chapter 21, verse 4. The Apostle Paul is on his way back to Jerusalem from a missionary journey. We always think of Paul as being perfect after his conversion. But this is what we read. They come to a certain place and it says, finding the disciples there, he stayed with them seven days. Through the spirit, they urged Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. And then you go on to the 10th verse of Acts 21. They've arrived at a different place. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. And then the 12th verse. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. Now, doesn't that all sound wonderful? But have we forgotten that the Spirit said, don't go to Jerusalem? And when Paul went to Jerusalem, in all of his bravely, he ended up in prison for two years where he had practically no ministry and the church needed him at that time. And finally, he was set to Rome. 
He didn't even get by with disobeying God. So we look at all of this and we see that the judgment principle starts off every venture and every new dispensation in the Bible. Wherever time God institutes something, we find the judgment principle. I'll show you what I mean. Israel was in their wilderness journey toward the promised land. God gave them the tabernacle, a place of worship. God gave them the law of Moses with all of the sacrifices and they were to do exactly as God said to do it. And then in Leviticus, we read that uh, there was a high priest named Aaron. He was a brother of Moab, Moses. He had some sons. Two of them were named Nadab and Abihu. Nahab and Abihu were offering the sacrifices and they didn't do the fire the way the instructions told them to. It says that they offered a strange fire on the altar. And fire came down from heaven and consumed them both. You can bet your boots that every priest after that built the fire the right way. <laughs> okay, you go in as they get into the promised land, you have this story we're studying about Achan. And by the way, the most interesting thing here, in the eighth chapter of Joshua and the second verse, what do we read? You shall do to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. <laughs> if Achan had only waited. If he'd have waited three days. Oh, well, that's the way it is with sin. But uh, you get into the the church coming into existence. And you have this story of Ananias and Sapphira. People were selling what they had and giving all of the money to the church to take care of the poor. Ananias and Sapphira wanted to get in on all of that. So they decided they'd sell some property, but they'd keep back what they wanted. But they'd say, we're giving everything to the church. Ananias went in first and Peter said, you gave it all. And Ananias said, every bit of it to God's work. Peter said, why are you trying to lie to the Holy Spirit? He dropped over dead. A few hours later, Sapphira came in to verify the story. They had it set up that way. I think she was probably wearing a Babylonian robe, but she came in and uh, Peter said, you gave it all to the church? She said, everything, we kept nothing back. Peter said, why are you trying to lie to God? And she dropped over dead. People were pretty careful about what they said about their giving after that, I would imagine. And I wonder how many of us would have ended up in the same spot. You ever lie about what you give? Oh, well, let's go on to something else. Something <laughs> practical, as we would say. Back to AI. God gave him a plan, said you're going to have to fight for it. But send in men the night before behind the city, set up an ambush. Go in the next morning, the men of the city will come out. The man, men in the ambush can come in and they can destroy the city. They did that. They won the battle without a loss. But there was really no miracle here. They had to pay the price. I look at this and... Uh, the secret of Israel's defeat at Ai was the sin of one man. And the secret of our victory and the fact that we can go to heaven is the victory of the God-man, Jesus Christ. I'm going to read this. Romans 5, starting with verse 17. For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, 
Just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. You understand that, don't you? Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden. Through Adam, we receive a sin nature. We sin. Christ went to the cross and died for our sins, and God pronounced it valid by the resurrection, and he intercedes for us in heaven. He gives us victory, but we still pay the price of sin. But if you have not been saved by grace, if you have not come to the place in life where you realize that the only thing that makes me right with God is not my feeble attempt of righteousness, but the only thing that makes me right is that I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior, and with that, his redemption. You have to do that. I, I tell you, I don't want you to go another day without making Jesus Christ your Savior. I, I tell young people, don't you let anything keep you from turning to Christ. Not your friends, not even your parents. I tell them, if your parents don't want you to be a member of Harvest or Christian Church, well, that's all right. But don't you let anything keep you from accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. I'm going to try a little thing in closing here on you. I really ask for your cooperation. I think God will work through this. If you became a Christian, meaning you made your decision to accept Christ as Savior, not the decision of your parents or something, but if you made a decision to accept Christ as Savior, by the time you were 18 years of age, would you very quickly just stand up right where you are, real quickly. Look around you now. All right, be seated. If you waited and did not make your decision until between the ages of 19 and 30, would you stand up real quick? less than a fourth of the others. All right, you be seated. If you became a Christian between the ages of 30 and 50, you stand up, would you? Real quickly here. That is a larger percentage than usual, but still not a very big percentage. I have one more. If you became a Christian, you made your decision after the age of 50, would you stand? I see two, three, four, five, six or seven out of this entire crowd. All right, thank you. Thank you. Be seated. Here's my point. Do you actually think you can win out among odds like that? The odds build up on you. The longer you wait, the more opportunity you give to Satan to get a grip on you. And that grip is the grip of, oh, I'll do this later. It'll be easier later. I just don't feel like it right now. So I hope that you really do something about it. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer?